with the ethical side, you just do it again and say, I'm going to do what my oath told me to do. I'm just, yes. I, it's kind of a rhetorical Absolutely. question. I, I, my research says no, it's, 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 kind of it's the right thing. It is. Yeah, there's no, no question. I would have done the same thing. Welcome back to another edition of Cannabis in Canada with Jason Wilcox. I have the pleasure of sitting here today with Dr. Rob Cameraman. Rob, thank you for coming yes, on the show. Yes, good to meet you. Um, now, there is just a long story here. This goes back to 2011 with yourself and, uh, right. and uh, in, in your case. What I'd like to do is roll this back and right. go back to 2011. Let our viewers get to know who is Rob, who is the doctor right. behind it. Right. Because my research has brought out a doctor that seems to be very uh, ethical in their approach and helped out a lot of people. Right. So you started in Coal Hill. That's right. But my, my roots go back to Coal Hill, or close to Coal Hill for, well, I don't know, about 45 years or so. There's only like 350 people, is that correct? That's right. Okay, yeah, so it's a very small town. Right. And you were a surgeon at uh, Sturgeon Falls, is that correct? Uh, I worked in the emergency room at Sturgeon Falls. Uh, I also worked at several other emergency rooms. And uh, part of my job was, working for Health Force Ontario, who supplies emergency physicians to underserved areas, which, you know, uh, Sturgeon Falls is very underserved. So, one other thing in my... That's my main day job, <laughs> you know. Yeah. One of the things in my research, and it really stands out, is, is you didn't graduate high school. No, not until uh, I decided I wanted to go to medical school. I was 38 at the time. 38? And you also became a surgeon, is that correct? Uh, no, I'm not a surgeon. I'm no, a surgeon. GP? GP? Doctor. Okay, emergency room. And uh, GP. Excellent. Right, right. Okay, so now back in 2011, as we know, medical patients couldn't get uh, papers signed, be in the B1 form for the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations or Medical Marijuana Access Division of Health Canada right. that issued these forms. Right. Now, in that scenario, I know myself, I was one of those patients and right. many others that couldn't get signatures. Right. Um, you decided to start to provide that service for patients. Yeah, it wasn't really a decision to do that. I mean, I think in 2009, 2008, one or two people came to me and, you know, they had seizure disorder and they asked if they could access medical marijuana and I didn't see anything wrong with that. You know, like I looked at the guidelines and, and all that and I looked at the form and then they had that little uh, form, that that waiver, you know. The CMPA that's waiver form. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. they do, you know, just yeah. for our viewers, the CMPA yeah. is Canadian Medical Protective Association that insure doctors like Rob. And, uh, and, and they actually had a waiver form under the MMAR that cleared doctors of all liability if they signed for patients. But yeah. nowhere in, in my research did I ever see that there was a limitation on how many prescriptions a doctor could sign. No, no. <laughs> I mean, at the time, is the limiting factor, you know. Uh, but through all this, through when I started to uh, sign in support of applications, my main work was in the emergency room. We decided to set up a clinic in Cohill because it's underserved, and that's the reason I went to medical school, is to serve people that, that don't have doctors, right? So, you know, the clinic would never stand on its own, but because I worked in the emergency room, I was able to support the clinic, you know. But, but but the people who came to me came to the clinic, so that started to get busier and busier. And, you know, as time progressed and I saw more people, it, it was just too much. I couldn't see that many people at the clinic. Yeah. So, you know, then we went abroad, so to speak, and no, we you, did, you not really, abroad, but- You really stepped out in your small town too by challenging the Ontario Provincial Police and actually writing a letter, I think it was to media, about uh -huh. the cover-ups going on in the emergency ward for drunk drivers associated that's, that's to correct. the mayor. And you stepped out and said, hey, I ain't, I ain't down for covering this up anymore. That's right. Yeah, that, yeah I'm glad you mentioned that because that's what started all the trouble, really. That's what I, yeah, I want to loop back because I often wonder why the OPP handled most of the investigation and the arrest when it really, in right. my own opinion, I think it would be RCMP jurisdiction. I would, I would think so. Yeah, exactly. If, if it's involving drugs, I would, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And in multi-provinces. Correct. 
So w what was the OPP's real uh, intent into that? So now that, that of course, just so our viewers understand, now when a doctor steps up and says, I'm not gonna cover up for this anymore, um, there's you know, certain people that are being privileged in the town because they know the mayor or they're connected with certain people and the doctor was asked, Rob was asked to be quiet. And he just simply said, I ain't down for that. Again, this lends to the ethics of what this story is about. The ethics behind the hype. There's the mainstream media hype, there's the court, and then there's the ethics that underlie everything. And that's what I'm glad we're here to talk about today. Right, right. So some of these 4,000 patients, how many would you think just came to Coal Hill alone to get signed up before going on the road? Oh, uh, well, that, that, that was ongoing. I would say, you know, in total, I signed over 4,000 people. And I would say maybe half came to the clinic and half came, came to uh, Woodbound sites, you know. Maybe a little bit more than half, but about 50 50. And at the time you signed, there was 13,000 licenses in Canada, yeah. and you signed for 4,000. 4,000. So you were like the main doctor in Canada that was helping medical patients. And in Health Canada's own estimates, 500,000 medical patients in this country. Heaven forbid a doctor actually help us. You swore that, that yeah. Hippocratic oath. Yeah. You swore to uphold and protect yeah. the ethical interests of your patients. That's exactly right. You believe that's what you've done, sir? Oh, absolutely. I, I was I was doing the right thing. I was always doing the right thing. You know, I mean, we are obligated as physicians to look out for our patients, do the best for our patients. You know, and if patients come to us with a concern, in 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 the majority of cases, it was uh, people who had chronic pain. You know, people who have chronic pain are generally put on oxycontin, Percocet, which is a dangerous drug, uh, but the studies have shown that if you use uh, marijuana in conjunction with uh, opioids, that uh, you, you decrease the need for opioids. So for instance, if you need 10 Percocets a day, but you use marijuana, you can get by with six Percocets a day. Some people chose to use only marijuana and totally get off the Percocets. Some people got off the Percocets before they even bothered with it. So this is like Harm Reduction 101, which is, this is now mainstream. Exactly. They're, they're now looking at this harm reduction in, in, uh, in, yeah, in drug facilities and everything else. Exactly. And uh, in Ugly, you were on top of this, you know, way Statistics back Statistics show that uh, 20,000 people die annually from opioid overdoses, accidental overdoses. There's suicides and those different things. Yeah, so in Canada, that equates to about 2,000 people in Canada that die from opioid overdoses. Um, in, and they've done a 10-year study or 12-year study, which shows that uh, in the places where marijuana is legal or accessible, that the deaths from opioids has decreased by 25%. So we could be saving 500 lives a year in Canada, 5,000 lives when you when you look at all of North America. And this is in an area where there's a big concern right now, you know. There always was a concern in my practice, but you know, finally they seem to have caught up to that. Being a 21 year yeah. medical patient myself and having yeah. been through that experience, right. you know, I agree a hundred percent, you know, it's absolutely silly um, for that to happen. I mean, there's no toxicity, there's no addiction, and there's no deaths recorded to um, marijuana. Good or cannabis, which I prefer to call it. Yeah. But yet, they allow even now, you're not allowed to prescribe THC or synthetic THC, but you're allowed to go back and prescribe opiates. Yes, and that's a, that's a, that's a big problem. They have a big ethical issue with that. And I've stated that to the college, and you know, I said, look, I've got a patient here, he's on medical marijuana, but now that he can't grow his own anymore, he can't afford it, right? So he's coming to me and he wants Percocet and Oxycontin. And you know, I, I have to say, I need to deal with this pain. So the only option I have is to give him uh, Oxycontin and Percocet, right? So how, how you know, this, I have to ask this because this really drives to the heart of me as a medical activist yeah. for patients. It drives right. to the heart of me because I know you took an oath and yeah. I know you want to uphold the Hippocratic Oath. And I have it's a copy of it here. I'd read it out for our viewers. I think we'll just post it up. but. Um, Knowing that you took that oath, how do you feel now? You got one arm tied behind your back. You can't prescribe the safer one that's going to help people. 
But the, oh, that's, this, that's the College of Physicians is telling you, and the Ontario College of Physicians is telling yeah. you to prescribe this other stuff that that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. How does that interfere with your oath? Oh, it interferes. I mean, it, that's that's the cause of my frustration, you know. And and I addressed that with the college. I called them, and I said, "Look, this is my issue. You know, I've got this big, big issue because I can't do what's right for the patient." They said, "Well, just send them to somebody who does marijuana or cannabis." I said, "Yeah, well, there's hardly anybody that'll do it, and now that it's a prescription, they can't afford it, you know." And and nobody seems to realize that majority of the population cannot afford it, you know. Most of the sick people are on some kind of disability, so they definitely can't afford it. So we're talking like the majority of people who are, like the Health Canada says there's going to be 500,000 people eligible, right? Well, 450,000 are not going to be able to afford it. So there you are, you're back to square one. Form fees now, if, if I get in an accident and I got to go to my doctor and get an insurance form, it could cost me $100, right? right? What was your what was your reasonable form fee for again a country that doesn't sign? There's only forty thousand patients signed right. and an estimated five hundred thousand by Health Canada's own admission. Yeah, right. So yeah. yeah, where would that kind of fall in? Oh, well the fees were kind of minimal. You know, I I started out at seventy five dollars yeah, to sign the paper, which uh, is comparable to other forms that I signed. Uh, actually some of the government forms are hundred and fifty dollars, you know. The OMA has guidelines as to how much we can charge. The medical marijuana forms are somehow not in that. There's a list, there's over 100 different forms, you know. And then the, the suggested uh, uh, charge, right? But doctors can charge whatever they want. I mean, there's no limitation. It's just however they feel, whatever they feel is, is appropriate. So, I mean, the, the $100 is well within the limits of of the OMA guidelines. I would say for me on disability that it, it would be certainly within the limits for any medical patient and also at a time in a crisis when there was, there was only 13,000 people at the time, right, 4,000 right. of which you held, right. and Health Canada still says there's 500,000 out there. Where are the doctors? Well, um, 13,000 when, when I was finished signing, but in the next year there was 30,000 people or 35,000 people signed up. So some doctors stepped up to the plate, but they stepped to the plate for the money. You know? I was gonna, we're gonna get into that. I was gonna, I was gonna ask about how, how that fallout is, but first let's talk about how this went down because I've, uh, you have no criminal record from my research, that's correct? That's correct, that's correct. So the police came in to Sturgeon Falls Hospital yes. while you were working on a toddler. Yes. And had the audacity to put you in handcuffs. Yes. And walk you out in your small town like a criminal. Yes. And I believe you're also, you and your wife were held in cells, is that correct? At least, or held temporarily yes. for processing? How long? Oh, were no, you? no, we were held overnight. Held overnight? Yeah. Well, that's See, just astounding. It went, it went in different stages. Like in January, they came to my office and arrested me, and uh, I was charged with uh, uh, trafficking or, you know, possession and all this kind of thing. And uh, so they took me to the station and I was processed and blah, 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 blah. But I was not charged, you know, so well, something not quite right there. Uh, but that, that was in January. And they took 4,000 patient charges, you know. Well, I mean, I, I don't think that's right either. But I, I have that, <laughs> this is in my notes too. Now. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Def uh, on the patient issue as well. Now, patient records, all of us out there understand it's not just the patient records. No. It's the fact that most of them, 36,000 of the 40,000 patients, chose to grow. That's exactly so right. So by taking yeah. those records, all those officers now have the addresses of people's grows and added the stress yeah. levels to those patients. Furthermore, right. 4,000 patients of yours couldn't renew their licenses that's and were the, thrown into peril issue. as a result of this. And to me, it's just, it's more of that top-down hypocrisy. And I'm wondering, you know, in my own, from my own research, I can't see why. I know, I know that there's at least one patient that died as a result of it. Yeah. So was it, it was a direct result? Of that. I direct mean, result, yeah. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but you know, at least one, yeah. Well, we've had a lot that have died just in the process of the coalition's battle right, that we're taking right. with the court that are just yeah. stressed out and uh, just have given up on the and whole. That's, that's a distressing part because we, we're here to help people. We're here to save lives, you know, and, uh, and it just, you can't do it. Well, come on. Absolutely. Now, your wife, Mary, and yourself, 
So you were both home? Oh, they, okay, to further from, you know, they took the charts, and that was in January. Then in, uh, in August of that year, so that's when I was arrested, you know. And uh, at that time, uh, Mary was also, well, she actually turned herself in, you know. And, uh, but we were kept overnight in jail, down to, you know, waiting to get bail and all those kind of things. Rubber sandwich in the morning, whole routine, cold yeah. coffee. Actually, actually, Bangkok wasn't so bad. <laughs> they treated me nicely, but yeah, yeah. the other places were not. <laughs> So yeah, that, that I just find that I find that very unfortunate. Then on top of that, they issued increasingly strong bail restrictions. Oh that, yeah, yeah. Can you it? maybe expand on that for us? Well, uh, initially the bail conditions were that we couldn't drive our vehicles, we couldn't, uh, and we had to go to the police station twice a week or once a week each, but on different days, you know, and that we couldn't travel anywhere. That we had to give up our Passports and green cards and all our documentation, but gradually that got uh, taken, you know, uh, that got, that eased up. So now we're able to travel to the U.S. where I work. And, but in the process of, you know, the arrest, uh, in the emergency room, I lost my job, obviously. You know? oh. So I lost my, uh, my ability to make enough money to support the clinic, you know. So, uh, so then we just had the clinic, and, and I needed to work somewhere. So, now of those four thousand patients, how many of them was the CMPA waiver form used on? Well, I, th I think they all had the CMPA waiver form. They all, they all had that waiver form. I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, there might have been a few missing. But, might, you know, I know, yeah. but I mean, even yeah. even if just a few, even if only a few that had it, I guess it begs the question. My understanding is the CMPA, Canadian Medical Protective Association, is there to help doctors when they're in trouble. Right. Have they helped you with your legal fees? No, oh, they withdrew their support. They withdrew their support. Which is unheard of. And you're still an active practicing uh, yes. doctor. So, yes. yeah. <clears throat> because I don't know enough about that framework, I guess. I guess I don't know enough either. Uh, uh, Alan Young is, a, is an attorney in Toronto. He's Alan's great. Big, on, big on social justice and those kind of things. And uh, he helped me with my appeal. And, uh, and they still said, no, we're not going to cover you. Uh, but they'll cover all kinds of bad people, you know. Like, uh, yeah, the guy's selling oxy by the, by the, by the truckload, you know, out the back you door. Know, the sexual don't... assault business and stuff. You know. But, you know, yeah, so they withdrew their support. And even with, with Alan's support of my appeal, they still withdrew it. <laughs>